Thanks, Judy. It's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Linda Morch. Uh, Judy's already mentioned Linda. Uh, Linda is uh, a very distinguished researcher. She's the senior researcher with the Adaptation and Impacts Research Group of Environment Canada and the adjunct of the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo. She has more than 20 years of experience in research, assessment, and advising in the climate change field. Her research inter interests include climate change vulnerability, impact, and adaptation assessments of water resources, and that's the topic she'll be speaking on tonight, and wetlands, uh, climate change scenario development, and effective communication of climate change. From 1992 to 1997, Linda led a Canada-US climate change assessment in the Great Lakes Basin, where adaptation <coughs> to climate change and interaction with stakeholders were key developments, and of course, that's an interest of us here in, in this basin as well. She's been an author or co-author or contributor to many, uh, many publications with Environment Canada on the subject of climate change and adaptation. For over 20 years, she's also contributed to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, you may have heard of, that was the co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. She was the coordinating lead author of the North America chapter for the fourth assessment report. And finally, she's provided expert advice to numerous organizations, including the International Joint Commission, the United Kingdom Climate Impacts Program, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and Uranus, whatever that is, you'll have to explain to us. So please join me in welcoming Linda Morch. It's a real pleasure and actually it's, a, it's an honor to be able to help celebrate your achievements after 10 years as the Muskoka Watership Council. What I'd like to do tonight is um, take, share with you some of my experiences because as a group who is action oriented, I'd like to give you a sense of how you might be able to get information that's relevant to adapting to climate change. But what I'm going to do, what this picture shows here immediately, is that there are two aspects to climate change or to water-related impacts of climate change. Um, two aspects of climate change that are extremely important. Across the top is too much, is not enough water, and along the bottom is too much water. And that happened in the Upper Thames watershed within the space of a very short period of time. And people had to respond to not enough water and, not, and too much water. What I'm going to talk to you today about is first I'd like to give you the big picture. Just drawing on some of the key conclusions of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change so you have an understanding of what the international community saying about the issue. But more specifically and relevant to what you are interested in is I'd like to provide you with three examples or case studies that I've been involved in where we've tried to explore the issues of climate change impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation. So that you may get some insights as to how one might go about uh, addressing these uh, particular issues. First, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Have people heard of it? Um, yep. I just wanted to give you a bit of background on what the organization actually is so that you can understand the importance or what the statements coming out of the IPCC really and truly mean. Um, first off, I was a member. It's primarily um, volunteer scientists who are nominated by their countries to participate. I led the chapter in North America. We reviewed over 700, um, we, we have referenced 700 publications. We reviewed hundreds more. And we were given our instructions on the, the topic areas that we had to write about by the governments of the world. They decided on what we could write on. And we could only provide information that was policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. Plus, we had an extensive three-round review process where in one of our rounds, we had only over 1,500 comments from experts around the world representing experts as well as governments 
reviewing our chapter and making comments. And we had to respond and keep track of every single comment and how we responded to it. So there's a high degree of review. If you want to get more information on the IPCC, we're now in the, third, uh, the fifth assessment report, which will be coming out in 2013 and 2014. This is just an example where we go for um, over 150 countries, review our document. There's what's called a summary for policymakers. And it goes through, it's about 20 pages, and it's reviewed in a huge room with translation, with representatives and delegates from the countries, where they go through word by word, um, line by line, <coughs> and subsequently that means that the whole report is approved. This is government delegations approving scientists' works. So when I provide you with a quotation that comes out of the IPCC, that indicates that not only scientists who are pretty scrappy and very um, hard to convince that sometimes that they should agree on things can actually agree on some of these statements. And then those statements are peer reviewed by governments around the world. So working group one is the science. And it talks about, I think, for me, one of the most telling statements was this first one was warming of the climate system is unequivocal. For scientists to say something so strong, unequivocal, they're not hedging very much. They're saying that they've detected multiple lines of evidence that the, that, that the climate system is warming. And two other comments is that in the second bullet, they talk about the attribution. In the last 50 years, from about 1950 onward, that they could see an influence or a signal from multiple lines of evidence that there was a human influence on that temperature signal. And lastly, looking forward, they gave a sense of global average temperatures, what we could see an increase of anywhere. This was their best guess of 1.8 to 4 degrees Celsius by 2100. So those are very significant numbers, and they came together through the review of science as well as approval by governments. Working Group 2, in which I was a member, I chose two statements to share with you. The first one is that this is a unique and um, interesting chapter in the whole report because not only were we talking about changes in climate, temperature, precipitation, but we were actually put together a chapter that was documenting observed impacts of those changes. So for example, changes in phenology, trees blooming earlier, um, trees or um, uh, foxes or frogs um, moving into habitat that they weren't in before. So that there were changes that we had anticipated and theorized about that we were actually documenting with over 2,500 different data sets from around the world. The second point is which is what I have spent my efforts with respect to um, is adaptation and the research that we do. And the conclusion that came out of this report was adaptation will be necessary to address impacts resulting from warming, which is already unavoidable. So what do we mean? Big graphic, and I'll run through it quickly, just to give you the context, is the first part here illustrates that in about the past 100 years, globally we've seen the temperature increase by a point degrees Celsius. If you look to the future, and that's the next part that I'm going to show you, this is what the projections are from um, global climate models, and there's over 20 different research institutes that are working on this particular issue. The yellow line highlights what we call the committed warming. That was the question we asked the climate modelers to answer is if you held the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in your model at 2,000 levels, and didn't people didn't add any more emissions, it just stayed the same, so zero emissions, how would the climate system respond? And that's illustrated here at about 0.1 degrees Celsius for the next couple of decades. We also talk about mitigation. 
and it's into the future where the different emission pathways and temperature response of the climate systems that you see here in red and green and blue lines are some of the projections from the global climate models depending on um, how much greenhouse gas, how many green, how much greenhouse gas is going to the atmosphere. And it's only in about 2050 to 2100 that the decisions or the greenhouse gases that have emitted actually start to diverge. If we go on a high emissions pathway, it's only about 2050 that we start to see a difference from a lower emissions pathway. In the near term, the square box here, is that most of the models indicate that we're going to be seeing a warming of about 0.4 degrees Celsius globally in the next 20 years. When you think about different regions of the globe, it's the Arctic that's actually going to warm the most in most cases. So the report also suggests that there's two key responses, and most people are familiar with the mitigation responses, reduce emissions or increase sinks for greenhouse gases. Adaptation, and so the responses that you can have with respect to mitigation are something no regrets or simple, like changing light bulbs, to something that's much more difficult to negotiate as a cap and trade program, for example. Adaptation, tries to think about how one might respond to the impacts of a changing climate. Um, how we might moderate the harm or actually take advantage of some of the opportunities that must arise as well. A least regrets or no regrets adaptation strategy might be to conserve water. And a more difficult or challenging adaptation strategy would be try to develop an integrated water management strategy. As a result of the changing climate, water managers were going to have to deal with new realities. And I'd like to, I, I'd like to leave you with two words. Change, because a lot of the way we planned and managed our, our water resources is that we think of stationary. A lot of our methods think that the climate's going to stay the same. We talk about climate normals. Now I'm saying to you is that the climate's not going to stay the same. It's going to be changing over time. As a result, water and resources managers are going to have to deal with changes in the distribution, where water will fall, where it will be, the amount, the timing, and actually the, also the quality of the water. But I think what's really important from a human perspective as well is that extremes are likely to become more intense. And so it's the extremes, not the average climate or climate or the impacts um, that are important. It's extremes like flooding or drought, for example. Uncertainty is also a key consideration. How do you make decisions on, under uncertainty? When, when we use the past climate, as a means to plan for the future. How do you deal with that uncertainty? 